started. Thank you all for logging in tonight and for joining us for our discussion. I'm so thankful that we have found ways during this very strange time to come together and be in community with one another. My name is Danielle Bear Eason, and I serve as the president of the Williams College Regional Association for Fairfield County, Connecticut. I'm so delighted to welcome everyone to this evening's virtual event with my classmate, Leslie Bloom. Shout out to the class of 98. I see a lot of you are online. And my former uh, Williams professor and sociology chair, Jim Nolan. Before we get started, I wanna mention that our program is being recorded. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat feature. Uh, it's turned on during the webinar, so please introduce yourselves. I see that some of you already have, and we can interact within the chat group with one another. In addition, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit questions for our speakers. We will do a Q&A at the, at the end of our program, but please don't wait until the end to submit your questions. Um, so this past August, I saw that my classmate, um, Leslie Bloom, came out with her newest book, 75 Years After the Hiroshima Bombing. And Professor James Nolan also released a book documenting the US government and military's efforts to contain and define the narrative of the Hiroshima bombing. Leslie is a New York Times bestselling author and journalist. Her book, Fallout, the Hiroshima cover up and the reporter who revealed it to the world has been selected as a New York Times editor's choice and was recently named as one of their top 100 books of 2020. Fallout was also named a Vanity Fair best book of 2020 and a best nonfiction book of 2020 by Publishers Weekly. James L. Nolan Jr. is the Washington Gladden 1859 Professor of Sociology at Williams. His teaching and research interests fall within the general areas of law and society, culture, technology, and social change, and historical comparative uh, sociology. He's, in the, he's the author of a number of books, including his most recent book, Atomic Doctors, Conscience and Complicity at the Dawn of the Nuclear Age, which documents his grandfather's role as a doctor in the Manhattan Project and how he and his medical colleagues were often torn between their duty and desire to win the war and their oaths to, to protect life. So with that, I'll remind you to please use the Q&A feature and the chat feature, and I will hand things off to Jim and Leslie. Um, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for hosting us. And second of all, I, I have to say this, I've been very immersed in the world of Hiroshima and how the narrative of Hiroshima was rolled out afterwards. And I didn't think that anything could shock or engross me after years of research, but um, Professor Nolan's book is bananas. Um, and Jim, I have to say, you know, just to, to start out, um, I had to work really hard to get to my topic for fallout. It required an enormous amount of research before I found the right subject, but you came to this subject in a really personal way and a fascinating way. And I was wondering if you could start by telling our, our listeners tonight about the most astonishing archive that mm -hmm. made its way into your clutches. Yeah, sure. So yeah, about eight and a half years ago after my dad passed away, uh, my mom came and visited us in Williamstown, and she brought with her a, a box of materials that no one in our family except my dad even knew existed. And um, she brought it just to show it to us, and I began looking through it and uh, was uh, um, astonished with what I found. And it turned out to be um, my grandfather's uh, collection of material from his time on the Manhattan Project. It had photos, correspondence, maps, um, uh, artifacts. Uh, it was an incredible kind of collection of materials. And, um, and you know, I, you know, knew my grandfather growing up. I knew that he had uh, been on the Manhattan Project, but I didn't know a lot about it. And, and so this was really the beginning of, of the research. And it turns out he had a very significant role. He was the post-surgeon um, in Los Alamos. He delivered all the children on the Mesa, including Robert Oppenheimer's daughter, Robert and Kitty Oppenheimer. He um, set up the safety and evacuation procedures for the Trinity test. He actually escorted the bomb, literally carried the Hiroshima bomb, little boy. Uh, I mean, that, that was a crazy scene in your book. 
I mean, I'm, he's, it's him and another doctor and they're sitting there with little boy next to them. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, I think, didn't they seat belt it down or they, 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 uh, you know, bonded it to the floor. I mean, it was just the, the front row seat that your grandfather had to the rolling out of the atomic stage yeah. was, it, it couldn't have been closer unless you, unless you were, you know, the head of the Manhattan Project, Leslie Groves or, or, or Robert, Robert Oppenheimer themselves. Yeah. I mean, it was just a, a hair's breadth away. Yes. Yeah, it was remarkable. Yeah. And he, he, he yeah, it did. He carried the bomb with Robert Furman. Uh, they, they were, he was part of the first group to walk into Hiroshima after the war in less than a, or about a month after the, the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Naga, Nagasaki. And he also participated in the ongoing testing of the bombs in the Marshall Islands after the war. Um, so um, I, I should also point out that I teach a class at Williams College called um, Going Nuclear. And I do believe that some of you took that class who are out there. And, um, and so in anticipation of that class, we read, we read John Hersey's Hiroshima. And in anticipation of that, I, I saw Leslie's book fall out and read it with great interest. It's a terrific book. And, um, and then used it in the class this semester when we um, discussed Hiroshima, because she, she does a wonderful job telling the story of, of, of his getting into Japan, how he was able to get through MacArthur's censorship and so forth. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And one particular connection I found uh, of, of great interest and that was, the, the, the entree into Hiroshima for Hersey was um, a particular document, um, a, a, an account of what happened in Hiroshima on the ground by a Jesuit priest named Father Zemus. And there was a connection in my story with the same document. And, um, and so um, I, I uh, found particularly interesting that, um, that uh, in terms of that document, Leslie Groves, the head of the, of the Manhattan Project, eventually kind of uses it uh, when he testifies before Congress in November of 1945. Um, but then also in the book, <laughs> we learn that Groves signs off on yeah. um, uh, Hersey's um, uh, uh, publication before it comes out. And I, I, I was very surprised by that. And I was wondering, Leslie, were you also surprised by that? And what do you make of that? That here's someone who's trying to suppress information coming out of Japan, and then he actually signs off on, on um, Hersey's document or his manuscript. Yeah, I mean, I was shocked when I found that out. And, you know, just to give some background to, to our listeners who may have not read our respective books, um, Fallout is about how um, in the year after the dropping of the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the government suppressed and downplayed the narrative about the true aftermath of, of nuclear weapons, in particular, um, the fact that they were radioactive mega weapons and um, the after effects of what they do to, to humans. And to a certain extent, um, the American press was complicit in rolling out that narrative. But for the most part, uh, the lack of truth that came out about those bombs um, really had to do with enormous government uh, suppression um, uh, on the ground in Japan of the American press corps. And the protagonist of my book, John Hersey, eight months later managed to get into uh, Hiroshima, which was a, res a restricted city and a restricted topic, and report to the world um, the truth about what had actually happened there. Um, and so as uh, Jim uh, just mentioned, through an astonishing set of circumstances, John Hersey and his editors at the New Yorker ended up having to submit the manuscript of Hiroshima to the War Department for vetting ahead of time. It was um, through deeply unfortunate timing, the Atomic Energy Act was passed and it had a restrictive data um, stipulation. And if you were found to be in violation of that, if, if you were found to have revealed um, in a press report information that could have been deemed um, uh, compromising of national security, you could go to jail, you could be put to death, all sorts of nasty things. So it gets submitted to Leslie Groves, who's the head of the Manhattan Project, who, as Jim says, had, you know, quite a central role in suppressing the narrative about the truth about the weapons that he had um, spearheaded in the first place. Um, so I found out about the submission to Leslie Groves uh, through a misfiled document in the uh, in the New Yorker papers and the NYPL, and I was it was like my last day in the archive. I was dotting the I's, crossing the T's, looking through a censorship file from 1943, and lo and behold, there was evidence in there that they had that the New Yorker had uh, and John Hersey had submitted the manuscript. And I won't tell you what I screamed in the middle of this archive, but it was not ladylike. Um, they didn't kick me out, but I could tell that they wanted to. 
Um, it was a shocking revelation. And then ultimately my research team and I found um, corroboration of, of this in Leslie Grove's papers. And it, it threw a bomb of its own into my project because what it did is it changed Hersey's reporting from an active subversive investigative reporting to almost an active access journalism. And, and so it took me months to, to unpack um, you know, that, that submission uh, to Groves and why Groves um, ultimately greenlighted it when it seemed to so completely contradict their, uh, his initial um, really emphatic campaign to suppress the truth about the nuclear bomb. Yeah, and also another interesting part of this, this story is that um, Hersey's um, first article and then book were so influential that it rattled uh, uh, American officials, including Leslie Groves, yeah. who actually then played a part in the construction of the Stimson article. Yeah. It's very interesting, isn't it, that he would approve it. And then he, you know, he's helping to kind of reassert, if you will, the official narrative to push back on Hersey's findings. Yeah. He's, a, he's, a, he's a bizarre dude and really complicated. And, you know, I always thought that, you know, if, if you know, this narrative was going to be turned into a, a, a film, Leslie Groves would be the juiciest and most d difficult role to play because his psychology is so, is again, so difficult to parse. So, you know, Leslie Groves does ultimately approve Hersey's manuscript, which details radiation poisoning and the radioactive aftermath of um, Hiroshima in excruciating detail. It's greenlighted. And then after it causes a predictable uproar and embarrasses the U.S. government, um, several uh, high government officials um, create what uh, Jim alluded to called the Stimson article, where they put out a counter article to set the, the record straight as they were. They were going to try to reclaim the narrative from, you know, nuclear bombs are, you know, the end of civilization and, uh, uh, and to try to reassert, look, we needed to drop the bomb because it ended the war and a land invasion would have been necessary and they just were trying to to just calmly bring it back to certain talking points and leslie groves without telling the other co-authors of that article sails in with his own edits without telling them that he was the one who greenlighted hersey's story in the in the right. in the first place so he's he's having it both ways um and he's he's super interesting and again very complicated yeah um, Professor Nolan, I was wondering if we could talk about, you know, uh, you know, as I alluded to in, in talking about, um, you know, the, the broad strokes of my book, uh, complicity in both of our narratives. And, you know, as I have said, especially the New York Times, I mean, they really played a role in suppressing, helping to suppress information in the immediate aftermath of the Hiroshima bombings. I mean, they really towed the line that, you know, these were conventional mega weapons that, uh, you know, the Trinity site was safe, that, you know, initial Japanese reports um, that were coming out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki about the devastation there were, quote unquote, Japanese uh, tall tales. Um, and, you know, for me, that, that was, for, you know, for me, my book was about celebrating the, the importance of the freedom of the press and really fine investigative reporting. So for me, that was a really bitter and complicated pill to swallow. And uh, I'm, you know, reading your book and seeing the, the complicated role that doctors played um, in the after in the building of the bomb, and then in the aftermath of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and you know the subsequent tests in the Marshall Islands, there was you know there you know many of the doctors, including your grandfather, you know on the one hand were deeply disturbed by their role uh, in in creating the atomic age and by the implications of the atomic age, but they were also complicit in helping the government create the exact narrative that I, I'm talking about in my book, um, you know, that, you know, radiation is negligible, um, you know, that these are, you know, again, conventional mega weapons. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about yeah. the role that complicity. Yeah, in sure. And in, in, in the book, I talk about it in terms of uh, the kind of caution, co-optation and complicity. And so in terms of caution, um, repeatedly, the doctors did offer warnings. I mean, they were the, the three main doctors I look at the three main American doctors I looked at are, are my grandfather, James F. Nolan, um, Stafford Warren, and, and Louis Hempelman. They were all trained in radiology. So they knew more than most about radiation and the effects of radiation. Mm -hmm. It was still a nascent field and they didn't know a lot, but they knew more than most and they were concerned about it. And so all the way to the beginning at, at, at the Trinity test, and the Trinity test was the test in the New Mexico 
um, desert, the Alamogordo bombing range that took place in July, so a month uh, in the month before the dropping of the bombs in, um, in Japan. They did a test bomb, a plutonium bomb, the same type of bomb that was actually dropped on Nagasaki. And, um, and my grandfather and, the, and the, the other doctors and a couple of the scientists um, actually uh, wrote a report and, and my grandfather personally took it to, to Leslie Groves in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they spell out their concerns and argue that they should implement um, safety and evacuation procedures for the Trinity test. Because can, can you talk concerns. about what their concerns were and, and yeah. how they actually panned out? Yeah, so, so they were concerned that there would be fallout, radi radiation fallout from the bomb. And they had done a pretest in, in military parlance. It was TR1 and then TR2 was the actual Trinity test. And from that pretest, they did measurements and determined that there would in fact be fallout. And, um, and this is what they warned Groves about. And, and, and so there's actually an opera called um, Dr. Atomic. And, um, and there's a scene where my grandfather confronts Leslie Groves. And Groves' response after he read the report was very dismissive. He says, what are you, some kind of Hearst propagandist? Um, because what Groves- and, <laughs> Right, and important to point out also that not just you know, fallout you know, in, the, in the terrain, but there were inhabitants, American citizens were living, living nearby. And this was, yeah, was right. known to, to right. Manhattan Project principles. I'm sorry, go on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so people were affected by the fallout. Cattle was affected by the fallout. You know, people who walked in to, um, to Ground Zero afterwards were affected by it. And, and there continued to be complaints in, um, the, the, in, in the area surrounding um, Trinity of, of people being affected long-term by, by the fallout. So, so their warnings were um, justified. And, and Groves' initial response was indicative of his general disposition. And that was, don't tell me about it. I don't really want to know about it. And that's not important. What we need is a bomb for the purposes of warfare. And we're going to go forward in, in, in spite of your reservations. And, and so, so this is an example. So then what do the doctors do? Like my grandfather and, and, and Stafford Warren, who's a head medical um, officer, they were, they were in the military. He's their boss. And, and so, so there's a certain sense in which they were then co-opted uh, by the military, and in some senses, they helped actually kind of hide um, the, the effects of, of radiation. So this happened at Trinity, it happened in Japan. Specific warnings were offered to, to Groves by uh, uh, Stafford Warren about just how much radiation would be in, in both um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the bomb. They, they warned about some of the tests that were taking place in Los Alamos the result of which were several of the American scientists who were working with materials at Los Alamos. Uh, there were accidents and they died. And they offered very specific warnings about um, the problems of radiation uh, fallout in the Marshall Islands and the ongoing uh, um, testing of the bombs in 1946 and 1948. And again, the, the, the pattern was similar. They'd offer warnings, the military would push back or ignore, downplay, and then in, in a number of cases, the doctors kind of helped them. You know, they, they kind of provided means by which they would cover themselves legally so that people couldn't bring lawsuits against the government for, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, in, affected, impacted by the hazards, the radiation hazards. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's so astonishing to me is that, and again, this appears in both of our books, um, is that one of the reasons why well, look, you know, the official U.S. narrative was always we we dropped the bombs to save American lives because if we if we hadn't dropped the bombs, then it could have cost you know the the the, the statistic that Harry Truman, President Truman, um, liked to trot out was it would have cost a million American lives right. and you know oh and, and let's not forget it would would have cost Japanese lives also right, and right. so. Um, the fact is, is that you know your grandfather and Stafford Warren and, and uh, you know a team of other physicists were at, and military members were on the ground in Hiroshima just yeah, weeks yeah. after, um, just weeks after the the detonations. And as you point out in your book, the radi radiation uh, measurements that they took were inadequate, and they knew right, it, right. and they knew that it wasn't measuring for all of the you know all of the different um, radiations that could be residual, um, and. And so subsequently, the U.S. military knew that, you know, this was not accurate information or full information. And yet one of the reasons why the U.S. military and government was so anxious to clear Hiroshima as a safe place was so they could move their own troops in right. to the atomic cities. I mean, there were tens of thousands of American troops who were moved in to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Nagasaki in particular, many of them were housed near Ground Zero. Right. 
Um, and so it, to me, it just seems so astonishing that, um, you know, the argument was that we did this to save American lives and yet American lives were so knowingly placed in danger. Um, and, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, the plight of the atomic vets um, very movingly in, in, in your book and, and, you know, the effects that some of them started to feel right away upon yeah, being yeah. in those. Yeah. Yeah. In those yeah exactly. So there's just two, two parts to that. One is, you know, Stafford Warren did actually at the end of July, Wait, can you explain uh, who Stafford Warren is? Yeah, right. Stafford Warren was a head uh, medical physician, and he actually led the group that went into Japan right after the war. So they actually landed in um, uh, Yokohama um, three days after the official surrender. So September 5th, 1945, and they walked into Hiroshima on um, September September 9th. And he led that. He was, he was the head physician for that effort. And he had written a memo to Groves saying, this is what will happen to troops if they walk into an area after... A nuclear detonation. And he even at the end of the memo specified various levels of exposure, some of which he said would be permanent damage. Those were his words, permanent damage. So, so, so you know, Groves was warned and Groves turn around, turns around um, right after that and sends a memo to his boss saying, no problem, the troops can walk right in. <laughs> so he just ignored it, you know. And then, and then, and then they, they, I'm sorry, go on. Oh, I was going to say, and so then when they go in, they measure radiation, and and they basically were told. So so you talk about uh, General Farrell in, in your um, in your book. I mean, they're basically told by him even before they went in that what we're to do is we're to go in and find that there is no radiation. <laughs> and one of the engineers who was with were, was with the group. It was called the Joint Commission. A guy named Donald Collins. He raises his hand. He goes, "Wait a minute! I thought we were going in to find out if there was radiation." And um, and he was pulled aside and told not to speak back to a superior officer. <laughs> and, and in a certain sense, that's what their mission was, to go out and, and find that there was no radiation. But the, the doctors had enough integrity that they didn't say that. They, in fact, did find, they did measure radiation. It was at low levels, and they realized they weren't getting all that was there. They acknowledged that, that their instruments were insufficient. Um, and, and, um, and then they come back to the United States and my grandfather and Stafford Warren wrote a report that they gave to Leslie Groves, in, including, which also included the Zemus uh, uh, document. And Groves testified before Congress, and he said, yeah. there is no radiation on the ground, none, none. He was emphatic. And then he said, and, and then only a few people have actually died from radiation. And the doctors tell me um, that it's a very pleasant way to die. <laughs> yeah, the most, the most, one of the most notorious comments ever made in a congressional hearing, in right. my, in my yeah. humble opinion. It's remarkable, and 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 um, and and if you read the document, it, it doesn't say that at all. In fact, Stafford Warren, who's the kind of signed author of it, uh, goes through in great detail uh, the symptoms of radiation sickness, and they're anything but pleasant. I promise you, yeah. <laughs> they're they're very it's very pain. painful, and, and and it's very clear from that. So so that was just uh, you know just completely. Uh, uh, um, fabricated. And, and so to turn back to, to, to Leslie's book, um, you know, so this is what's so remarkable about Hersey's book is there's this effort to cover this up. And what Hersey does is he shows for the first time the American public what, is on, what really happened on the ground. And, and when I was reading the book, um, I, was, I noted that, that there was some, you did, you had some discussion also of William Lawrence. Now, William Lawrence yeah was a, a journalist, a, a New York Times award-winning journalist, who was basically handpicked by Leslie Groves, the military head, to be the reporter for the bomb. So he was actually at Los Alamos. He watched the Trinity test. He was in one of the planes that flew over um, Nagasaki when the bomb was dropped there. And he is, is, is very different <laughs> from Hersey. He was a very uh -huh. nuclear enthusiast. And, and, um, and it struck me that you know, part of your book is really kind of a, a pitch for the importance of a free press, a free and independent press, and yet you have these two very interesting uh, journalists who are antithetical to one another, and I'm just curious if you could talk about that, elaborate on that. Yeah, I almost don't even know where to begin with with uh, William Lawrence. I mean, his nickname in the, in the New York Times newsroom was Atomic Bill because he was such a nuclear enthusiast, and, um, you know, as, I, as you know, I've told you in previous discussions, initially Fallout, my book, was um, supposed to be a, a joint biography of John Hersey and, and Bill Lawrence, Atomic Bill, um, to, because they're so diametrically opposite, you know, for, you know, from each other. 
And, you know, I mean, so, so much of what happened between August of 1945 and August of 1946 was the rollout of a massive PR campaign on behalf of the US government and US military in which they're casting the narrative of the bomb in this very specific way. Well, guess what? Atomic Bill is a really important part of that. So as you say, he was personally conscripted in the spring of 1945 by Leslie Groves. Um, from his desk at the New York Times um, to be the quote unquote unofficial historian of the Manhattan Project. So he just disappears from, from the New York Times. All of his papers, his colleagues, you know, with the exception of a few editors, don't know what's happened to him. And what's happened is that he's, he's zigzagging among all the sites of the Manhattan Project. Um, and he's, he's creating basically propaganda material for Leslie Groves and, and for the other principals. And he's even created um, fake um, obits mm -hmm. for the principles of the Manhattan Project in case the Trinity test goes really wrong. Um, and he creates, you know, a lot of the press materials um, for uh, when the time comes and when they're using it, you know, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki or, or whatever Japanese city was going to be first to be bombed. Um, he does this, by the way, while he's still on the payroll for the New York Times. Um, then, you know, later on, when, when you were talking about how um, you know, the, the doctors uh, accompanied a military um, trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki to really survey for the first time in person, you know, the after effects of their handiwork. Um, there's another uh, PR opportunity, like a junket, a press junket that's held by, by uh, Leslie Groves and Oppenheimer and, and Atomic Bill, lo and behold, is there. They're all at the Trinity site. And, you know, you could talk more about this than, than I could, but Trinity is... It was a lot more polluted than than Hiroshima and Nagasaki ever were because they detonated the bomb what a hundred feet above above the ground, um, and yet Atomic Bill uh, rolls out this front page story for the New York Times that says you know radiation reports of radiation are are quote Tokyo tales, um, and it completely toes the line uh, for you know for for Leslie Groves. Um, Can I just interject there for a moment in terms of the the, the issue of the 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 caution and the warnings that the doctors mm -hmm. offered. So Warren and Nolan were over in Japan, but Louis Hempelman was at the Trinity site with a Geiger counter during that photo op walking around. And he became so concerned about the level of radiation on his Geiger counter. They finally went up to Oppenheimer and said, you got to get these guys out of here. Oh, and, wow. and he was fearful that a journalist had overheard him talking to Oppenheimer. So go ahead. Well, you know, if it had been Atomic Bill who had overheard it, they wouldn't have had anything to no, worry about, no, right? Because no, 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 no. he's, you know, he's he's locking down the story for them. And you know, he Atomic Bill ends up writing um, ten articles for the New York Times on the bomb. And as you say, he he accompanied the Nagasaki um, uh, bombing run. Uh, he was the only journalist to have done so. So many people, cons many journalists, considered that he had gotten the scoop of the war in in seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, most of the articles, again, you know, they're really burying the, the truth about, about the bombs and the radioactivity. And ultimately, he would win um, a Pulitzer Prize for that reporting. John Hersey would not win a Pulitzer Prize for his, his revel revelatory reporting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it was, you know, uh, he's, Atomic Bill was just the most astonishing character. And, you know, he ends up being more of a peripheral character in my book than I would have liked. Um, but I, you know, as you tell me, somebody is, a, another scholar is now working on a, a full length biography of him. And I will be the first person to buy that because that yeah. guy is bizarre and fascinating. Yeah, he really is. And, and then the juxtaposition of the two, you know, being so, so different, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, so Jim, I'm wondering, you know, I mean, there's so much, you know, I feel like both of our books ended up taking on and look, but they, both of our books came out to commemorate more or less the 75th anniversary of the, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But I feel like in the current environment, political environment that we have found ourselves in 2020, both of the books took on an unhappy relevance, I feel. And, you know, we're talking today about, you know, the issues of, of science, versus government policy. I mean, that's definitely something, you know, the battle that we've definitely seen an enormous tug of war between science and policy, uh, you know, in with regards to COVID. Um, and that's definitely something that you talk a lot about in your book and that you, that you document. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit. Yeah, so more. it's interesting because as I set up the, the book, um, the first chapter is about life at Los Alamos, which is this amazing, you know, place isolated, beautiful Mesa, these intelligent, you know, um, physicists from all around the world, you know, coming 
And so you actually had three communities. You had the military, you had the scientists, and then you had the doctors. And, and so my book is really focused on the doctors. And the doctors, are, the doctors were, in a certain sense, sort of part of both communities, but not really part of either. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and so th theirs is an interesting story because um, they had training in radiology, as I mentioned, and often offered warnings about, uh, about it. And, and you had a scientific mindset was, which was basically, can we do this thing? Can we build this bomb? Can we actually split the atom and, and harness the energy of the atom? And the military, of course, wanted a bomb for the purposes of warfare. The doctors ostensibly are concerned about, you know, health, safety, patient care, right? So they have different kind of vocational emphases. And, and there are instances where the scientists would join with the doctors, but there was so much pressure to, if you will, no pun intended, doctor the science, that, that when a couple of the scientists joined up with the doctors to warn about radiation, there were two in particular, Joseph Hirschfelder and John McGee, and they came up with significant warnings, so much so, as Louis Hempelman said, if they were right, we should not have done the Trinity test. And it turns out they actually were right. <laughs> but after they came up with their findings, there was pressure in the lab for them to change their findings, to, to change it enough to justify going forward uh, with the bomb. So it was a kind of, a kind of um, uh, you know, making science, <laughs> pushing science to say something that they wanted. And, and my grandfather remembers the pressure that they, they actually had at that time, a clear understanding of how many rentgens, which is a kind of a, a, a measurement of radiation exposure that, that would be an acceptable amount. And yet it was actually the scientists who pushed back and said, no, we can take more than that. They'd been working in the labs in Berkeley and Chicago, and they thought they could handle more. And they, they, they finally said to my grandfather, you know, how much do you think I can take? And my grandfather had this very sardonic wit, and he, would, he, he, he just responded back to them. He goes, well, how much do you want? <laughs> I mean, like challenging, they're challenging him uh, mm -hmm. sort of thing. So it's, it's an interesting and complicated situation because um, it, it wasn't exactly scientists versus the military. Yeah. But, 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 but a kind of complicated, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 arrangement. Um, I, I want to, uh, there's an important question I'd like to ask you if I, if I can, it kind of, in some ways it kind of switches gears, but um, both at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, you, you offer this very provocative quote um, from, um, from John Harsey, and that is, he uh, said to, uh, in 1986, he says, what has kept the world safe from the bomb since 1945 has not been deterrence, in the sense of fear of specific weapons, so much as it has been its memory. Now that's a really interesting comment, particularly given that deterrence has been, if you will, the defining kind of strategic policy of, of the kind of nuclear world that we live in. And, and, and so that's a, that's a very powerful statement. I wonder if you could just kind of elaborate on that. Well, I think what he, I mean, what he really meant was that the memory of Hiroshima and the reality of what happens there, you know, the portrait that he helped bring to the world, it was um, a, a deterrent in a different way, you know, and that um, one of the reasons why it was so important to him to get in there in the first place and reveal the truth about the weapons and to show in a really intimate way, you know, what the weapons do to, to communities and to the human body. I mean, to just really allow people to empathize with, you know, being in the, in the ground zero of a nuclear catastrophe was um, that he, it, it helped create an impression of the weapons that might not have been otherwise created. It, it created a visceral repulsion yeah. for many of them. I mean, when Hersey's report came out, it changed public opinion overnight, more or less. I mean, it didn't matter whether you still supported the bombings on Japan or not, and many people still did, but people recognized after that, that living in the atomic age really meant something really scary. And he helped change the perception of these weapons um, into you know, a, a regard of them as last ditch weapons or weapons that should not be in circulation at all even, should be banned entirely instead of you know, being part of what Harry Truman called you know, a bigger piece of artillery. Because really you know, from the end of 1945 until Hersey's report came out, I'm sorry, from uh, August of 1945 until Hersey's report comes out in August of 1946, there really is kind of a, a complacent acceptance that you know atomic bombs were were now part of the arsenal and could be used and should be used. They were cost effective. You didn't have to do troop movements. Um, but after the report comes out and people realize you know what these weapons really are, it um, it really changes again public attitudes toward them. And so I think you know for him 
it was extremely important that the memory, you know, this very visceral memory of the of Hiroshima be kept alive because, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki are the only cities that have ever been targeted in, in nuclear warfare. I mean, those the survivors and uh, the uh, witnesses you know, to those to those nuclear catastrophes. These people are the only people who can say what it's like to be on the receiving end of nuclear warfare. And he felt that as long as their testimonies were still in circulation and people could still hear from them, that there would be a continued um, antipathy or revulsion to, to those weapons. But he said that once the memory of those experiences started to get spotty, it was, you know, to the peril of all because it would start to uh, make nuclear weapon, use of nuclear weapons possibly more tenable again. Yeah. Yeah. A, a couple points on that. One is uh, there's, a, there's a story of one of the Manhattan Project scientists reading Hersey's book and crying af after reading. I mean, he, he himself was so impacted by what, you know, had happened based on his own, his own creation. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the other thing that, that I, I note, <laughs> um, is that that uh, that even today, you know, high school, you know, textbooks often the kind of the, the atom bomb is an abstraction. It's a mushroom yeah. cloud, yeah. you know, and and you know, the, the the and then 1995, right, 50 years after the bomb, they wanted to show images of of um, the Habakasha, the, the victims of the bomb, and and what happened on uh, on the ground, and you know, the, the the veterans pushed back, and that never happened, right? Only the fuselage of the Enola Gay ended up being displayed at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. So there, there is still this kind of resistance to to acknowledge uh, what actually happened and and portrayed in um, in in Hersey's book. And and I think that one of the great things that your book does is to bring that back up to to kind of a public memory. Yeah, that was the idea. <laughs> was Leslie and Jim. As I've told you in our other meetings, I could listen to you both banter all day long. You're extremely you. entertaining to watch and to listen to. Um, we do have a number of questions that I want to get to if we could switch gears a little bit. Um, and if others still do have questions, please do put them into the Q&A and you'll find the link at the bottom of the Zoom. So the first question we received was from Laura Booth. Um, and Leslie, she's asking about um, more information about Hersey's 1980s trip to Hiroshima and the mm -hmm. sources um, that you use to tell the story. And is there more about his trip that did not make it into the book? And the follow up to that is why did he seem so melancholy, even though those who visited Hiroshima in the 80s saw the city as vibrant and incredibly peace loving? Um so there's a considerable uh, Hersey archive at uh, Yale, and you know there is there is a lot of information about um, his trip there. Um, you know, Hersey's editors tried to get him to go back right away in 1946 or 47, and you know Hersey immediately put the kibosh on that, and he it, he did, literally didn't go back for 40 years. And I think that he felt compelled to go back for the 40th anniversary because. You know, we were in Star Wars by then. You know, the Cold War had accelerated. We're in, um, you know, 1980s hell, and he was incredibly alarmed that the, the exactly what Jim and I were just talking about that the spotty uh, the the memory of Hiroshima was quote getting spotty in in uh, the nexus of power, um, and so he he felt the need to to. Um, go back and really document the long tail of what happened to the six protagonists, the six Japanese and German protagonists um, who he documented in, in the original Hiroshima. Um, you know, on, honestly, it was, um, the records are not, you know, it, it's, it was really a straight ahead trip. It was like him, I want to go back. And his, his uh, editor, William Shawn, said, and go back and he, William Sean, edited the, the, the second piece as well as, you know, having really helped birth the first piece in 1946. Um, and in terms of his melancholy, I mean, I have to say, I mean, both, both Jim and I have been to Hiroshima in, in the course of our research. And even though it was totally rebuilt by the time Hersey got there and, you know, built upon built by the time I got there two years ago, it had, you know, nearly 3 million people living there. I mean, it's, you know, heavily serviced by, you know, Starbucks and McDonald's and coaches. I mean, it looks inter almost interchangeable. You know, when, when you're in Hiroshima, it is one of the most, for me anyway, it was it's one of the most psychically freaky places you could possibly be. I mean, you just, 
it's literally a city built on top of a graveyard. The, the uh, governor of Hiroshima told me that it's never been properly excavated. Every time they're digging for, you know, a project there or a new building, they find, you know, fresh remains, not fresh remains, but, you know, new remains. Um, and it's just, um, the city is, it's interesting because the city wants to be seen as a phoenix that has risen from the ashes and also as a you know a testament to the tenacity of human spirit but at the same time it's it takes its role very seriously or its leadership takes their role very seriously as witnesses to to what happened there um and to to play a role in uh you know possible abolition of nuclear weapons going forward and that the latter for me is really what what defines the city and it's just I mean, it's it's not a place where you're you're like giddily walking down the boulevards. Mm -hmm. and, and I would also add on that is that he, um, what he uncovered in terms of the plight of his um, interlocutors was the long term effects of radiation. So his, you know, the first his first interlocutor was um, Father Klein Sorge, so one of the Jesuit uh, 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 priests, and he got his medical records. <laughs> I mean, that's, they're they're in his files in the in the, in the Library. And 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 um, and uh, what it shows is that his the the, the, the impact of radiation had long-term consequences. I mean, he basically suffered from radiation poisoning the rest of his life, and he yeah. discovered that. And that's another thing that Hersey, forty years later, discovered when he went back. And th thus, you can perhaps understand him being rather somber about it all. Mm -hmm. Great, um, Paul Lipoff um, wrote in, and why don't you start with this, Jim? Do you disagree with the contentions that the use of the bombs saved both U.S. and Japanese lives? Um, yeah, so that's that's a that's a good question, and it's um it's certainly part of the the official narrative that that is what happened. Um, there's all sorts of evidence, <laughs> and um, and debated by historians um, that um, that is not in fact the case that. Um, that it's a false dichotomy to say that the only options available to the United States um, was either dropping the bomb or a costly land invasion that would cost hundreds of thousands of lives, American and Japanese. Um, you know, a lot of kind of historical research has shown that that was not the case, that Emperor Hirohito was seeking to um, make some kind of face-saving surrender, um, that, uh, that, you know, the, US, the, old, the, the, the United States' own um, United States bombing survey went in and, and concluded after interviewing all sorts of uh, officials that um, that the United States or that Japan uh, would have su surrendered by December of 1945, even by perhaps by November, without a land invasion, without the nuclear bomb, and without Russia declaring war on Japan. So there's a lot of evidence <laughs> to, to suggest that um, that it was not necessary, and that the official narrative. That, that a number of, of, of kind of, there's a great deal of kind of historical evidence that calls that into question. Great. Yeah, I think Jim, you know, covers that uh, very, more than adequately. And I would just say that, you know, that another part of the official narrative is that the, 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 the bombs had to be dropped on, on city centers. They, they, uh, uh, a sample bomb couldn't have been dropped someplace else, you know, just a demonstration bomb. Um, it, it wasn't an option. That was the, the, the military's main line. And, and I've always um, found that to be contentious. I mean, they, they're, the, I, what they would say, what the military said then in the rebuttal was that um, if they, nothing would have been more detrimental than if they had, you know, called for uh, international observation of a demonstration bomb and it had been a dud. Um, so they had to go ahead and, and actually drop it. Um, on, on Hiroshima. Um, and so I, I agree that there is evidence that that the bombs were not necessary. But, you know, as Jim uh, points out in his book, we, we have actual sound from Leslie Groves saying, you know, that the bomb was less about Japan and more about the USSR. Yeah. And, and I would also add that, you know, a number of the scientists um, on the Manhattan Project, including Leo Zillard, who actually helped initiate the whole thing when he went and got Albert Einstein to send a letter to to President Roosevelt to initiate the, the um, project, he, he and about seven, you know, 70 scientists signed a letter that they wanted to get to the president, um, first to Roosevelt, then after he died to try to get it to Truman, to basically say, let's think about this, and perhaps we should do a demonstration bomb, not drop it uh, on Japan. And, and Leslie Groves was actually kind of part of the, the, the process 
by which that letter never got to Truman with 70 scientists kind of uh, suggesting this. Mm -hmm. Um, this next question is from Matt Libby, um, which maybe Leslie you want to take first. Um, he says, I'm always fascinated by the left turns that turn up in research that lead authors to make fundamental changes to their narratives, like your discovery, Leslie, in the archives. What other surprises stand out to each of you from your research on these books? Hey, Matt. <laughs> it's nice to hear uh hear from you not not to you i wish i was seeing everybody right now in the gallery view um thank you for the question um, i had a couple of left turns and you know one of them was the the leslie grove submission that was the, the biggest one for me but another one was um and for, also came from the new yorker files uh, another sort of misfiled either misfiled or overlooked or ignored document that um gave me kind of an entree into how how the Russians felt about Hersey and Hiroshima. And um, it was a pretty astonishing document that um, showed that uh, the Russians after Hersey's Hiroshima came out were so mad about Hersey's reporting that they sent in their own reporter um, but from Pravda, but this time to Nagasaki to create sort of what was considered to be the anti-Hiroshima, the anti-Hersey reporting. And this Russian reporter came back and wrote an article and then a book um, basically re rebutting everything that, that Hersey had, had found in Hiroshima and said, you know, that, you know, there was not radiological poisoning, that the bomb was actually, you know, not as bad as anybody had said, that he had talked with protagonists um, who had survived just by, you know, lying in shallow ditches. Um, and for me, that was another major lead into, uh, you know, a, a, an important part of my narrative. Why on earth would the Russians want to rebut the findings of, of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And it was because they, they didn't have the bomb, the U.S. had the bomb, and they regarded, um, th they were at a very significant disadvantage, obviously, and they felt that reporting such as Hersey's drove home to the Russian, to the Soviet population, excuse me, um, the extreme disadvantage which they now uh, faced vis-a-vis -vis the U.S., and so they were at pains to downplay the significant and dangerous leverage that the U.S. had <clears throat> over the USSR at that point. You know, of course, the U.S. would only have um, the nuclear monopoly for a few more years because the Soviets you know, got the bomb in 1949, and um, but they they continued to to hate Hersey for quite some time after after that. And in fact, they um, only just published Hersey's Hiroshima in Russian uh, translation this year for the first time. Yeah, I mean. Uh... As I say in my acknowledgments, you know, this, writing this book was a great adventure. I mean, it, it really was just learning a lot as I went along. But I, um, because it's such a dark topic, let me let me share one kind of very happy uh, finding I had. And that is, when the Joint Commission went in, you know, my grandfather was part of this group that went in there, and they were in Nagasaki and Hiroshima and Tokyo for about five weeks, and they were working with the Japanese doctors. And while there was some tension, for sure, um, they also developed. A, a great deal of, of affinity for one another. There was a um, there was a, a, a number of friendships that were started, and um, and they, they became quite fond of each other. It was really it was a remarkable thing. Here are these enemies, and they came in contact with one another, and and developed these kind of um, bonds. And just one quote in particular is, is wonderful. This is um, this is a, a, a Japanese doctor uh, talking about one of the doctors of the of the um, Joint Commission. And he said that um, uh, though we could not speak the same language, the same tongue, we understood each other's feelings. He was a gentleman and all my staff and patients became fond of him. And then he says this, there is no boundary where sympathy and understanding are present. <laughs> I thought that was a great quote that here in the midst of this, you know, complete devastation, these enemies are coming together and in their common task of trying to figure out the biological effects of, of the bomb that they, they developed these, uh, these ties. It was a very kind of, Nice finding, yeah. Um, okay, next, Adam Borden, um, also from the class of 98, has a question, Leslie. Uh, do you think the desire to create the fake narrative was to cement our image as true victors or to contain any risk or litigation? Huh. So and really he said you're doing a great job. Oh. <laughs> Um, it's a great question. I definitely want Jim on this question too. Um, I would say that you know, it, 
hugely about litigation, obviously, but I mean, it was also, you know, the US had just won this painfully earned military victor victory over the Axis powers. And I mean, they were, the US government and military was hugely concerned about qualifying their moral victory as well. And, you know, er earlier in 1945, um, when they're firebombing the hell out of Tokyo, we have Secretary of, of War, um, Henry Simpson already worrying that they're gonna, uh, the US is gonna quote, get the reputation for outdoing Hitler in atrocities, which I thought was the most astonishing quote. And, um, you know, I spoke at length for this book with um, Richard Rhodes, who uh, documented the, the, won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Making of the Bomb. And he talked a lot about how, how much the, um, they were trying to avoid the the ghosts of World War One in which gas was used because that was seen as so uh, morally re reprehensible and you know now here the U.S. has used this experimental mega weapon which is you know in, infinitely more destructive and and uh, uh, in a in a very permanent sort of way and so I think that the image was was profoundly important to them. But, you know, as Hersey wrote in a very angry first draft of his, of his article, Hiroshima, um, this story was never gonna stay under wraps. The long, you know, the long-term effects were never gonna stay under wraps and how to make a bomb itself was never gonna stay under wraps. So they were not gonna be able to um, maintain the moral advantage through this kind of subterfuge and information suppression indefinitely. And, and as it concerns the issue of litigation, and um, I, that's again, that's not something I was looking for, but it kept popping up um, yep. over and over again. And, and the Trinity test, for example, um, you know, Stafford Warren was very concerned about radiation and wanted to go and investigate it further. And he's basically told by the military doctors, don't worry about it. We, we want this to go away. You know, basically asking him not to go investigate further. And an explicit concern was uh, because of litigation. And, the, and the, there were several accidents, as I mentioned, in Los Alamos. Um, Harry Dofflin and Louis Sloton both died doing this, ex this experiment called Tickling the Dragon's Tail, where they were trying to test criticality with plutonium. And, um, and, and again, the, 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 there was a doctor who was in the room when S Louis Sloton died. The, the other men, there were other men in the room who also got radiation exposure, and eventually some of them died from it. Um, and one of them who had been exposed couldn't even get, he, had, he eventually left Los Alamos and moved to Chicago, and he couldn't even get his medical records from the doctors in Los Alamos. And it was because they were told, the doctors were told, do not cooperate with this guy. Alan Klein was his name. Do not cooperate with him uh, because we fear litigation. And so they wouldn't even give him his medical records. Same thing happened in the Marshall Islands. Marshall Islands you know, they set up a medical legal board. <laughs> um, and again, and it, it was all, all almost kind of straightforwardly um, for the purposes of covering themselves uh, with the anticipation that there would be lawsuits brought against the, the military. And in a certain sense, they were successful. I mean, the, 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 the veterans who in the Marshall Islands didn't get compensation until late 80s. or uh, So many of them died before they ever got any kind of recognition or compensation. And Jim, can you talk about, you know, for instance, well, first of all, how many how many nuclear tests took place in the Marshall Islands? Well, the well, quite a few <laughs> have taken place. Um, yeah, yeah, right, right. Something like uh, sixty four or something like that. But my my grandfather was there for five, so two two at Bikini and three at Enaritak. Um And you know the the damage there has been devastating. I mean, Bikini Island or Bikini Atoll, the the Bikinians still cannot to this day live on that island because it's still so irradiated. Uh, um, there's cesium-137 in the soil. And so they can't live there. And, and, um, and the, 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 you know, obviously the long-term consequences <laughs> have been significant. And, um, and there was significant fallout from um, Castle Bravo was a first, one, one of the first uh, hydrogen bombs that we dropped on Bikini. And it had significant fallout that, that affect not only B Bikini Island, but other, other islands as well. Well, I bring up the sheer number of um, you know, nuclear uh, tests in the Marshall Islands alone, because in terms of litigation, I mean, how many people were witnesses and participants in each of these, um, you know, each of these uh, uh, tests? And you can imagine if, if the floodgates opened. That's right. That's what, right. What, that, what that would look like. And, 
um, you know, as you say in your book, I mean, even just the, the communities surrounding the Trinity site, the test site in New Mexico, they've never been compensated. Is that, that's accurate, Richa? Right, that's right. Yeah. There, so there is a legislation that was passed that, that, passed that, that did compensate veterans from the Marshall Islands as well as the Nevada testing site downwinders. But to this day, the, the, um, the communities living uh, uh, around the Trinity test have not been recognized or compensated. I think that's a, a great um, spot to pivot a little bit. Um, fallout is the perfect um, image, not just in terms of the radioactive elements of the bomb, but there was severe fallout for both of these men for the rest of their lives in terms of their careers. Um, and this moment in time was really just a, a snapshot in terms of their long career. Could you tell us a little bit, um, each of you, about how your grandfather and Hersey lived out the rest of their lives and what the incident kind of, how it resonated for them and how it played out in the fallout of their careers? Sure. I'll, I'll. Um, so my grandfather was very keen to get out of the military. Right when he got back from Japan, he set in motion the process by which he could get discharged in the military. He did continue to participate for a couple of years, as I mentioned. Um, but he did so in a civilian capacity, and um, he really wanted to get back to being a doctor, um, and and that's actually what he did. So he actually became a, a very successful gynecological oncologist, um, did all sorts of innovative work using actually you know radiation technologies for the purposes of 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 healing his profession, and he was very keen to do that. He really wanted to get back to being a doctor. He wanted to have nothing to do with with the military. In fact. Um, his daughter, my aunt, who I interviewed for the book, remembers him reading about the Nevada testing that continued to go on and, and shaking his head saying, they have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. You know, being very displeased with the ongoing uh, nuclear industry, if you will. Um, so, so, so that's, that's, that's what he, he did. And he, and he was happy to be a doctor and loved being a doctor. And he, was, he moved to Los Angeles and that's where he, he practiced. And, um, uh, he, he died in 1983. He was only 68 years old. He died from a heart condition that has been associated with radiation exposure. He would never make a, a claim like that himself, but uh, I have no doubt in my mind <laughs> that, that he has significant amounts of radiation, both in his medical practice as well as in his military service. And, um, and for example, you know, he, one, of the, one of the consequences of radiation exposure is um, uh, infertility, and he was after, after his time in Japan. So he, they had two kids. They wanted to have more, but they couldn't. So that, the, the, and, I, and it's very possible that, that his early death at 68 had something to do with the significant amount of radiation that he was exposed to. So interesting, uh, Leslie. Uh, yeah, John Hersey. Um, he, ironically, he sort of, he pretty much left journalism after his blockbuster success with Hiroshima, and uh, he did, he did, he did report for the New Yorker a few more. Um, profiles, including one on Harry Truman, but after that, he he left to write novels, um, and it, it's ironic because you know he was trying to prove a theory that you know fiction would have a greater impact than reporting, and he wrote I think a dozen novels in his very long career after um, after Hiroshima came out, but none of them ever received the renown of of his his reporting Hiroshima. I mean, it was the defining moment in his in his professional life. Um, and he died in 1993 of cancer. Wow, well, I really appreciate both of you taking the time to speak with all of us tonight. Um, it's about an hour. I'm sorry that we didn't uh, get to all of the questions. Um, they're saved in the recording, so hopefully we can get back to you all who we didn't answer your questions live. If you'd like to read more um, about these two books, I'll hold up the covers one more time for um, Atomic Doctors, Conscience and Complicity at the Dawn of the Nuclear Age, is Les and then Leslie's is um, Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up, and the reporter who revealed it to the uh, world. One last reminder while we're together, this, um, as I said, is recorded, and there are other lectures that are recorded that you can find um, on the Williams website, if you go to alumni.williams.edu and forward slash virtual. Um, and future talks are also listed there. So be on the lookout also for some new virtual Williams events and activities 
uh, related to the bicentennial of the founding of the Williams Society of Alumni in 1821. And thank you again to, for joining us tonight, especially to Jim and to Leslie, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you all for being here. Good night. Good night. <laughs>